Yeah. Any questions over this? Again, I, I will, before you get out of here, um, we're actually gonna even practice a little bit of what the humorology assignment is. So we'll do that together in class. And it will make sense, I promise. Oh, let's see, what else? Oh yeah, so there's the assignment. I'll open that up a little bit. There's a Dropbox and then here's your, your three examples. Um, kind of do this, uh, well, I'll wait till we get to the assignment to talk about that. But let's get started. Kind of where we left off, which was not there. But this is where we left off. And I think I told you last week um, that I never have anything on PowerPoints where you just literally have to write everything down. Well, I lied. This is the only time. There's one PowerPoint slide in the entire class uh, where I actually want you to write the entire thing down. So you all took a stab at defining humor, and everyone pretty much answered it a little bit differently. And maybe you realized as you were typing out your answer that, well, gosh, I guess this doesn't cover all the bases because humor can be so many different things. Um, a couple definitions included the word nonverbal. Well, <laughs> lots of humor is verbal. Uh, some people use the word verbal. Lots of humor is actually nonverbal. So, so humor is a lot of things. So there's a definition. It's a little bit wordy, um, but I'll walk you through it. And maybe you can even write down sort of like a, a cliff notes or paraphrase version. Humor is actually two different things. So it turns out it's impossible to really define humor just as like in one sentence or as even one concept. One thing humor is, it's a response to something. That's essentially what this first part says. And now you know the emotion attached to it. It's a mirthful response that usually happens around other people. I'm, I'm just putting this in different words so that I'm not regurgitating to it. But I like this. This is pretty, it's from the response end, this pretty much captures it pretty well. It's a mirthful response that usually happens around other people. That happens because you detect some kind of incongruity in your world. Could be verbal, nonverbal, accidental, physical. And it's expressed through smiling and laughter. Of course, we can tack on things like to various degrees and things like that, but this pretty much captures it. So the first thing humor is, it's a response. It's an emotional response that you have to something out there that usually happens around other people. That's basically all we're saying there. But humor isn't just a response. Humor is also something that you do as well, and that's what the second part is. So humor can be a response, but humor can also be anything, anything that you do, any action, any words that you say. Of course, it could be something that you're reading, so a written word that elicits that response that we're talking about in number one in someone else. So it's something that you enjoy and it's something that you do. And yeah, I'll hover here, I know now we're all writing things down. You promised me would do this. And I'll just add this too. There's three really big ways that human beings differ with regards to humor and both of these, one and two. And that's in how much or how easy it is for us to create humor. The humor that we understand, we don't know what the word comprehend means, that's what that means. The humor that you understand this is largely developmental, but it could also be cultural and also experience-based. And of course, we all differ in the types of humor that we appreciate. Throughout the semester, half the things that I show you at the beginning of class, you're like, what the hell is that? Some stuff you might enjoy. I will tell you today, today is filled with lots of different clips and examples of things. You can see how well our senses of humor match. They may match really well. They may not match at all. But that's neither here nor there. All right, so can I move on? I don't want to. I don't want to move on in case people are still writing stuff down. 
But basically, in a nutshell, humor is something that we respond to. Humor is something that we do. It's usually around other people. And we really differ in how much we create it, how much we appreciate it, and what we appreciate, and also what we understand. <laughs> I love the first one. So we sit down, we try to think. In fact, a big chunk of chapter one is trying to dissect and describe it. Remember, the first humorology assignment is called humor dissection. So we'll see what that's all about. But gosh, how many different types of humor are out there? It almost seems endless. And maybe you've never really given it much thought of how you could dissect the different types of humor that you experience and that you create. Well, it turns out there's about four, oops, there's four really broad categories of humor that you are exposed to, or maybe you create it, I don't know. And underneath those four broad categories, there's all sorts of different humor types. And that's what I gave you a list of 13 different types. I don't think this list is complete is done. In fact, these are actually two more than what's listed in your textbook. But at least according to the research, these are the 13 types of humor that a human being is most likely to experience. And we're going to be using this in the humor dissection assignment. But we're also going to be defining these, some of which, some of these probably sound really familiar and you'll be able to easily just write down a definition by yourself. Some of these you may never have heard of before, but that's okay. That's why you're here. But over here, I have a little circle. Let me just tell you the four different categories. You don't need to write them down yet because we're going to go one by one, but you can just listen. So our four different really broad categories of humor. The P stands for performance. So performance humor simply means anything that's created. So all the Saturday Night Live clips that you watch, anything that you'd see on stage, going to a stand-up act, that's essentially performance humor. It essentially means something that's been created for you to watch, download, upload, whatever it is. That's our first category. Second category, really broadly, of humor is jokes. Now, can jokes be inside performance humor? Of course they can. But another form of humor you're going to experience is jokes. People will tell you jokes on a daily basis. I already admitted to you openly last time that I'm terrible, believe it or not, at telling jokes. I'm, I'm just a horrible, horrible joke teller. The third category, the S and the C, stands for spontaneous conversational. Now, I didn't really think about this until today. I don't know why I wrote this down. Like, I guess that's me. Spontaneous conversational simply means well, exactly what it sounds like. It's spontaneous. So it wasn't necessarily planned. It just sort of emerges in your interactions with other people. And I think this is the one thing people don't understand when they think of using humor and teaching. I don't get up and tell jokes. Every 10 minutes, we're going to have a joke. Error. The hell would that do? It's just spontaneous. It just happens. It is planet. it. I have no idea what's going to happen in the next 60 minutes, which explains most of my life. And then finally, the last one, that's a U, not a V. I'm just terrible at handwriting. The U stands for unintentional. So this could be unintentional verbal humor, unintentional physical humor. So just thinking about these for a second, because we've actually studied it, although I'm going to study it again, because I think there's going to be a shift. Out of these four, they've studied this, these different broad categories, and this was back in 1999, actually, when, we'll put it this way, in the world of humor, there's lots of studies that have been done, but not a lot of studies that have since been replicated. Does that make sense? So lots of people have studied things for the first time, but not a lot of people have replicated it. Which of these four categories do you think? Just think about your average daily experience. And I think it's even more fascinating because we're living like we're living right now, right behind masks and isolated and all this stuff. Which of these four types do you think you experience the most and the least like on a given day? Would be the most? Yeah. Okay. And which one would be the least? Um, performance. Performance, like watching stuff? Yeah. What, what were you going to say? It's a good I guess. Wonder. I don't I don't actually know. In 2021, I don't think we know. Yeah. Um, 
feel like for performances, even though like you can like stream Saturday Night Live, like there's the aspect of money that mm-hmm. people need like to be able to pay to like go yeah. see like comedians. So probably like spontaneous, like maybe that's the like, most for jokes. I know I tell a lot of bad jokes. So gotcha. <laughs> I try to tell a lot of bad jokes. I try to tell good jokes. I just I'm that guy that screws it up. Like little of 75% to the joke, I'm like, oh shit, wait, can we go back to the beginning? Because I forgot to tell you the one thing. <laughs> like, and then it's all just, then it's just you. So just like just yourself. One more guess. But you wear that Steelers jersey with pride. I sure do. That's okay. Love my Steelers. <laughs> um, I'd say probably spontaneous is number one for me. Yep. And my jokes are allowed because I, I watch a lot of stand up comedy like Joe Rogan and Bob yeah. and stuff, so I see a lot of performances. So yeah. jokes are my music. Okay. But lots of performance as well? Yeah. Well, it's good. I mean, I hear a lot of spontaneous, and it actually makes me feel happy because it means you guys are still talking to people because you, so to have spontaneous, you have to be interacting with someone. So, all right, we'll see. I'll give you the answer that they found in 99, but as we go, we'll think. We'll try to come up with your guess of. How much this makes. All right, so our four broad categories. The first one's really easy because it's just really simple to define. Performance humor, that, and I already defined that for you. But now you can officially write it down. Again, it's anything that's prepared and delivered to you. Of course, it can contain jokes. It can contain other things as well. Very simple. Performance humor. Number two, of course, is jokes. And I don't want to sound too commonsensical here. We'll actually get into this a little bit more when we get into some cognitive theories of humor of how exactly do jokes work and what ingredients are there, but really basic, even though you could probably guess this. All jokes contain Three really basic elements. There's, of course, the setup, which is the part that I always screw up. You know, you're laying the context. But of course, there's the punchline, which I never screw up, but usually it doesn't make sense because I screwed up the setup. But that punchline does something. And here's where our cognitive theories of humor come. The punchline does something magical. When you hear it, you spend all this time. And sometimes the setups are really elaborate, like they go on and on, and you don't even know something's coming. But the punchlines force you into some kind of perceptual shift. You get exposed to what we simply call incongruity. And incongruity is exactly what it sounds like. We kind of played around with this last week with McGee. Incongruity is just when a schema becomes violated somehow. Something suddenly doesn't make sense, or you see it in a new way. So every single joke on the planet, every single one of them, they all include that very basic element of incongruity. We'll play around with this a little bit in a second. Most jokes, not all jokes, but most jokes that are told contain one of two elements, either some type of aggressive innuendo, so some type of aggression against And I don't mean like in a hostile, absolutely cruel way, but there's usually some type of aggressive element to it. Again, from really moderate hostility to, right? Again, so I don't mean like literally putting someone down, like, oh my God. But there's usually a little twinge of aggression and or some type of sexual innuendo to most jokes. Again, not all. How many of you are a fan of, and now we have categ- we're not going to get into all of them, but there's categories of jokes, right? Let's talk about riddles. Right? But of course, we have this whole thing called, how many of you enjoy dad jokes? Why, why do you like dad jokes so much? I don't know. You don't know? Because we, we've actually asked people, well, why do you like them so much? 
Okay, that's that's. I, I'm not sure how much you. Some of you might even be familiar with that, but let's let's watch a few, and maybe you'll maybe you'll catch on. So, I personally find them entertaining. All right, so here's Will Ferrell and Marky Mark telling some. Dad. Hey, hey, good to see you. All right, what's up? What are you doing? What's up, guy? Yeah. What do mermaids wash their fins with? <laughs> so they have a contest going. So Will Ferrell just scored a point because he made. You know, he didn't even tell them the punchline. <laughs> Anybody? Think of your dad telling you this joke. Sea sponge. Sea sponge. It's a good. No. I don't know. I'm not guessing again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just let. <laughs> Tied. The first part was funnier. You should have never thrown a punchline. That was terrible. Did you know what King Arthur's time? One of the nights of the round table collected taxes. His name was Sir Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Top that. What did the fried rice say to the shrimp? Fry your rice. What did the fried rice say to the shrimp? Nobody? Really? All right. Don't walk away from me. <laughs> that was that, yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. Did you guys see Harvey and went right into a fight? <laughs> That's not real, is it? Yeah. It was a family food. <laughs> <laughs> did you hear about the superhero with a lisp that always worked out? <laughs> He's four. <laughs> Bad ending again. All right, what are you talking? How can you? Uh, what kind of car does a tank drive? A yacht wagon. All right. Some of you are in physical pain right now. I can see this. So, what yeah. makes these so funny? You nailed the first one. One is they're they're live they're so basic. Like they are they they go back. Dad jokes take us back. You just original puns, right? As a kid. Not right. Like no one says who's that. I hate you guys. Huh? Here's, here's Thank you, though. You find me. I've never heard this before. Let us. I don't want to. <laughs> Let us take our seats. My nine-year-old, well, she's now nine. Well, this, this joke will become part of our class in a few weeks, but I'm just planting a seed. When she was six years, this is just a stupid pun, right? You don't even barely laugh. Let us, let us take our seats. But when she was six, she would laugh for, for days. She would tell this joke over and over and over again. But it's kind of like it's 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 kind of like a dad joke, not told by a dad, but told by a six-year-old. It's the same thing. So one reason dad jokes are so funny is they're so simplistic, right? There they are. But the other element of dad jokes, now not all of them, but another reason dad jokes are typically so funny is they're also very innocent. <laughs> response. <laughs> There's actually a word that I like you. Now that you have this list, I'm gonna. <laughs> Number 11, tendential. So now we'll, we'll cheat. We're going to skip ahead a little bit, but you don't, need to, you don't need to write it on your humor types yet. But anything with a sexual, like overtly sexual or aggressive theme is what we call tendential humor. It's actually a Freudian term, which we'll get to later on today. But usually dad jokes are void of that, which makes them, they can be told, they're, so they're simple and they're family friendly. Put it that way. They're typically void of the sexual aggressive themes that a lot of jokes have. So dad jokes can be enjoyed by your grandma, the pastor at church. In fact, pastors at church are like notorious for telling dad jokes. Because, right, they're just, they've been scrubbed clean, big put it that way. But they're still funny. Depending on if you find them funny or not. Alright, so in just out of sheer curiosity, since we're where am I at? There we go. I got lots of stuff up. I apologize. 
So let me just take a guess. Um, in the 1999 study that was done only once, what percentage of humor, well, let me tell you how they did it, by the way. They asked a, a group of you, like, how, they always, we always use college undergrads, right? You guys are like slaves to the world of psychological research. What they did was they asked you to carry around a diary for three days. And any time that you encountered humor, that you, or at least you thought you did, you would just jot it down really quick. You just make a note of it. Then you'd have this daily recollection of over a three-day span of the different types of humor that you experienced. It doesn't matter if you found it funny or not. It's just, hey, I was exposed to, to this. What percentage do you think performance was? Just We don't all need to agree, by the way, but just ballpark it. Just shout something out. So I, heard 20. Okay, so I heard 30, 18, and 25, so I'm just going to put down 20. Sound good? How about jokes? 42, very specific. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? 48 and a half. All right, I'm going to say 45. <laughs> so, 40, so, well, careful what you're doing here. You're not leaving much room for anything else. But if you want to adjust this later, you know, that don't All right, so moving on. So, categories number three and four. So, number three is our spontaneous conversational. Remember, we're still talking about the four broad categories, not really into our types yet. Spontaneous conversational is what happens with others. This is interactional humor that is unplanned, hence the word spontaneous. What that means is this type of humor is very context dependent. So the phrase you could write beside that is, and we've all said this, you had to be there, right? It was spontaneous. It was in the moment. It was contextual. It doesn't mean it can't be funny later. And it can especially be funny to you and whoever you were with later. But whenever you try to explain it to others, it just never seems as funny, usually to the, the other people that weren't there. So another quality of this type of humor is the humor diminishes rather quickly. It was spontaneous, and man, when it happened in the moment, it was really funny, but the humor quickly diminishes because it's so context-dependent. And we've studied people's, wouldn't this be fun? This is why studying humor is so much fun. It can be anyway. The three main types of spontaneous humor that people encounter with their friends, with their peers, professors, whoever it is, the first is anecdotal. That's what the A and the, and the E and the C stands for. I just didn't feel like writing anecdotal. <laughs> Fingers just stop. So anec what, is, what does this mean? What is anecdotal humor? Story. Yeah, storytelling of some kind. And the second, which is pretty broad, wordplay. <laughs> What do you want to do today? Let's do wordplay. That actually was wordplay. So exaggerations, whatever it is. Just goofing around. With words, phrases, songs. My daughter does this all day long. And then the third, of course, is irony. If you didn't know, the running joke there is Alanis Morissette's song. Isn't that ironic? Did you know there's no irony in that song whatsoever? It's actually a bunch of coincidences, but isn't it coincidental? It just didn't have the right ring to it. What is, what is actually irony? And now you could actually we have another definition here. In that song, I'm not sure if you even know it, but she just talks about a bunch of experiences that happened like, oh my God, how did that happen? This guy never took an airplane flight, and the first one that he takes, he starts to crash. He's like, that's not irony, that's a coincidence. So what's irony? I was going to call on you because you lifted your arm and told you I'm like an auctioneer, like, you in the grave. Any idea? Isn't this fun? That's irony. Yeah? Okay. I was going to say, like, say one specific thing. Exactly. Isn't this fun? Of course it's not. No, it's 
No, thank you. No, exactly, that's exactly what it is. Saying one thing, but me having, saying one thing literally, but contextually meaning something completely opposite. So it's freezing outside and you're walking around, like, oh my God, it's so hot. Of course you don't mean it. You mean the opposite. That's irony. And it takes, there's different forms of irony too, but basically that's the type that people experience with their spontaneous conversational humor. What percentage do you think this makes? So we've only got, and this is your fault, not mine, we only got 35% left. What would you give the spontaneous conversational? I don't know why I'm shifting. <laughs> that was unintentional. Someone's got to shout it out. 5%. 5%? Yep. Okay, thank you. And thanks to that, you just filled in 30% being unintentional because that's all that's left. So then we have our unintentional. This can actually take two basic forms. I do the first one all the time. So we had this classroom downstairs. I think I told you about it last week. Teenage 100. It looked like a stadium. It had stairs that went up the middle. For some reason, even though I know I run into things all the time, I run into desks that I know are there. I don't mean to do it. I would always trip and almost fall at least once per semester when I would teach in that class. So unintentional physical humor, of course, is one. But the more interesting type, I think, of unintentional is the verbal. And the first, one of my favorite examples of this, is what we call ambiguous verbal humor. I'm going to show you this and then see if you can come up with a definition. So here's an example. And these are real, by the way. Um, I know Jay Leno is not on TV anymore, but he kind of took this from Johnny Carson. I don't think Jimmy Fallon really does it. The fun Conan O'Brien used to do it, only he used purposely fake headlines. Um, but Jay Leno, people would send these in. Um, headlines from newspapers, and this is he would always just put them on a show if he thought they were funny. Hey, how much money was spent doing this? County names Freedom Bridge. Freedom Bridge. <laughs> Mental Illness Group offers demonstration. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> helicopter, Valentine's Day special. Go for a helicopter ride, look, and soar over the beaches. <laughs> So apparently he must have caught something on Valentine's Day. <laughs> now this is my favorite one. I'm going to read this to you. See what it says? Man reports wife missing after a year. <laughs> uh, I told Lawrence County Sheriff's Deputy stated his wife is missing. See, so you become worried, but he hadn't seen her in a year. <laughs> Guess the dishes were piling up there. <laughs> <laughs> Accordion enthusiasts gather for convention. <laughs> <laughs> it's twice as big as last year. <laughs> this make you paranoid. Excessive worry is cause for concern. <laughs> <laughs> You know how fat are we getting in this country? You know something? It's unbelievable. All you can eat buffet, drive through window or bill. You just drive up when they have a big thing there. Is bring the food you keep going around? Is that what it is? You know, Kev, you, you, Kev, you've been on the road a lot. You know, being on the road is tough, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Being on the road is hard. Look at the picture of Willie Nelson. Look at the picture of Willie Nelson. Look at the picture of Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson, <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so you get the idea. So ambiguous, ambiguous verbal humor is so when something is either printed or said accidentally, and then the way that it's said makes it humorous. You didn't mean to do it, and newspapers are filled with this. But you, you'll see it all the time. There's something like you read it in the right way, like that's not what we actually intended to say. A second, I don't know why I took it down because I have another example of this. Another example is Freudian slips. We'll actually get more technical on this in a little bit. 
But one of my favorite examples of Freudian slips, I told you lots of clips today, so we'll get rid of the dad jokes. We'll get rid of this. Oh, it comes from a movie that was probably on TV 78 times in your house over the past month, but it's still worth watching. Can I show you something? Oh. I was just smelling, smiling. I was just browsing. Your wife or your girlfriend? What? What happened? Shopping season, the stores are running less hooter than they are, hotter than they are. Ooh, it is warm in here. You have your coat on. Yes. Oh, do I? How did that happen? Because it's cold out. Yes. Yes. It is. It's a bit nipply out. I mean nippy out. <laughs> what did I say? Nipple. <laughs> oh, there is a lift in the air, though. Can I do something out for you? <laughs> For my wife, God rest her soul. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, not that. We're just divorced. She's <laughs> history. And obviously, she doesn't wear underwear. <laughs> there are plenty of shopping days left until adulthood, adulthood, which is to say, Christmas has a new, new lock. Not a lock, I don't have a lock, but I mean, you know, just, if I had a lock, not in the sense that you think I said. <laughs> oh, good golly. It's the season to be married. Well, that's my name. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, Freudian slips, of course. You probably could guess what this one was. But what that is, is when something unintentionally sexual bubbles to the surface and comes out in your language and replaces a word. We'll give you a more technical Freudian explanation. Maybe in about a half hour or so, that's where we're headed next. But Freudian slip. And then two, that maybe, so maybe here's learning something new. Maybe two that you've never heard of before. A malapropism. Any idea what this is? We had a president about 10, 12 years ago that was really famous for this. And God bless his soul, he actually made fun of himself for it. Yeah. Um. Is it like a bad proposition? It's not, but that's a good guess because malapropism, you're thinking not what it is. Yeah. Like mixing two things together, like two things. You're, it could be that. You're close. It's, it's simply when you, you fumble over your words and you typically make up a new word that doesn't exist. <laughs> Or, when you completely screw up a well-known phrase. One of the ones that, so George Bush, the younger one, who you probably know is the old one, but he's not, because his dad was also president. But the younger George Bush, who was president, he did this all the time. He would just slip over his words. Again, it's not a Freudian slip, because there's nothing sexual there. He would just mispronounce things, missay things all the time. And then he would... And in moments when he would be trying to sound profound, he would just completely screw up what he was trying to say. One of his most famous ones was when he tried to recreate the, the fool me once, like never again, fool me twice. And I, I can't remember how he screwed it up, but it was just like you're watching the TV, like, what? And it just, but again, he, if you didn't know, he actually has a great sense of humor. And he did a speech um, maybe about three or four years ago. He went to the press convention speech that we no longer have anymore. Someone got rid of it. But he got up on the stage and he actually has a book. Someone actually wrote a book of all the things that he screwed up and he read it to the audience and it was hysterical. But So malapropism. You unintentionally just screw up your speech. I, this is something I do all the time. And then finally, a spoonerism. And it's called a spoonerism because it became famous because of a guy named William Spooner. 
And William Spooner, I don't know what, what his exact job title was, but he used it. He was the guy that would come out with the little staff and he would introduce the queen. And more than once, he said this, completely unintentionally. And in fact, he didn't even know he said it. Three cheers for our queer old dean. A spoonerism is when you exchange the beginning of one or two or more words in a sentence and it completely changes the intent of the actual phrase. Of course, you meant to say three cheers for our dear old queen. But he was famous for doing, he did this more than once. And that's a spoonerism. Probably pretty rare, but still funny when it happens. So, the 1990 study, where Martin, he's actually the guy who wrote this book, he was teaching a class like this, and he was curious about, well, what types of humor do people experience on a daily basis? Most of you that actually took the time to guess were right. By far, the biggest chunk of the pie, at least according to the students carrying around their little three-day journals, was spontaneous conversational. In fact, 70% of the humor they encountered was spontaneous conversation. I remember this is 1999. So most of you probably weren't even alive. Maybe some of you. But even the world wasn't like drastically different. When you think of media, it was drastically different. No one's walking in 1999. I mean, you had cell phones, but you didn't do anything on your cell phone. Your cell phone was a phone. It wasn't also a computer. It was maybe a calculator. Right? There was no Netflix. There was no, like, all this stuff that exists media-wise just simply wasn't there. So that probably changes things a little bit, but still 70% was spontaneous conversational. Number two was performance. About 17% was performance humor. But this was mainly people watching things on TV, like Saturday Night Live and sitcoms. So you sat down on Thursday night to watch Seinfeld. There's your performance humor. One tally. Eleven percent was jokes, leaving room for only two percent being unintentional humor. So a little bit different than what your guesses were, even though I'm not sure what your personal guesses would be. So I'm not sure how many of you walked past. It's, it's not very dramatic. It's not like we have a new building and like a neon sign saying humor lab, humor lab, right? So the idea behind this was, if you've noticed, there's a little sign out there. It says the humor replication project. And one of the main goals of the humor lab is to replicate some of these studies that, right, they've been done once. They've never been done again. They're still in heat. I mean, it's still in the textbook that this is what people experience. But this, this would be pretty easy to replicate. I mean, in terms of doing a study, you don't really need any money. You just need people with bodies and journals, right? That, so this would be pretty easy to replicate. Um, so this is just on the top of my mind. So if you have any ideas, if you'd like to help out, I don't really know where the idea is at um, because I had all these ideas before the pandemic happened and then we all had to go home. So the, the goal actually was last year to make that a big part of this class. So we'll see. I know it keeps beeping, so. Um, just ignore it. So, I don't know. What do you think would be different? I have a guess. Yeah. Um, I think that we would have a lot more uh, unintentional humor now. <laughs> Actually, I don't, know. I don't know why I said that. I'm not. It's okay. Never <laughs> I take it. I retract my <laughs> I think we'd have a lot more performance. 17, I don't know, I could be wrong, but maybe especially, you know, it'd be interesting would be to do it now when we're still masked up and social distancing and all that, and then do it again when we're not doing all this and see if anything shifts, because I think you'd see us, unfortunately, I think you'd see a drop in the spontaneous conversational, just because so many people aren't hanging, I know you're still hanging around others in certain contexts, but not as much as we used to, 
and performance, I mean, I don't know. I guess it varies by the, that'd be interesting. It varies by the person. A lot of people just wash stuff. So like how much you guys wash, right? A lot more stuff than your counterparts did in 1999 because you can. You're watching something on your phone. Yeah. I figured out why it's an intentional <laughs> you know, in my head. Um, I think that just our generation especially finds things that like really aren't even that funny yeah. to be hilarious. Like I know TikTok um, has a lot of stupid stuff yeah. on it. That's See, that that would be performance. Uh, I guess so. Uh, Damn, all right, well, I retract my statement again. He said, well, that's where my mom, when I'm thinking of performance, that's what I'm thinking of. Think of all the things that are out there that are funny, right. that didn't even exist. Yeah. Yes. It depends. See, unintentional really by the book means you just, you see someone fall, like on your own, out in the environment, and you laugh at it. So, but ep epic fail, isn't that like produced though? Like you watch it? I don't know. I thought you were like, send a video over. Yeah, I thought you were like, I was like, you send a video to them yeah. and then hope that they put it on their. Like, and see, by the book, if it's a video, it's a performance. Okay. I know, see? Even right? if it was unintended. Yeah, okay. See, now we've created a whole new category. Maybe this didn't even exist 20 years ago. Because how would you? I don't know how you classify that. See, we could, we could argue and debate. No, okay. I don't want to do that. But. <laughs> But that's why I think things have changed, like TikTok, that's produced. I mean, some of the stuff is on there. Yeah, it was it was unintentional, but then you gave it the music and I'm old. <laughs> Are you on the TikTok? <laughs> um, no. Anyway, why did I say that out loud? I don't know. All right, any questions? Just the four basic types before we get into our typology here. I have some examples to show you, and then we'll we'll talk about the assignment and all right, well, we'll get to Austin Powers in a second. All right, so, so if you have a typology, you can, I printed one out so you can just all take your notes right there, right in front of you. And again, you're going to be using this for the dissection assignment. All right, so number one, irony. We've already described this a little bit, but what is this again? Just so we're all on the same page. There we go. So something is spoken... I mean, it could be written to. The literal meaning is opposite of the intended meaning. That's irony. The literal meaning is the opposite of the intended meaning, and therein lies the humor. Now, these next two you might use interchangeably, but there's actually a difference between satire and sarcasm. They're both aggressive, and they both mock or usually put down something. But what's what's the difference? If I'm doing satire. Did that come first? Yeah, I thought so. If I'm doing satire. What are yeah? Something. What is what is that something? Actually, the way you put that actually makes sense. But uh, because it could be a person, it could be a situation. Be a place that has funny rules and you make fun of that. So, so satire is making fun of an institution, something larger than just a single person. Put it that way. So, if you make fun of Mount Union in general, why would you do that? You're doing satire. If you make fun of a religion globally, you're doing satire. If you make fun of the Steelers, satire. Okay. And in typical Cleveland fashion, we were also close. Even though, I don't know, can't feel too bad. It was. Sarcasm, though, is it's not the opposite. Sat or sarcasm, excuse me, is just more narrow focus. Sarcasm is when you make fun of one single person. So, mocking the president. Talking your teacher, talking your friend, whatever it is, that's sarcasm. So satire, larger institutions getting made fun of. Sarcasm, just more singularly targeted towards someone. But both have obviously very similar elements. They're usually aggressive, teasing, putting down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Now the next one is, the first thing I'd like you to write down about it, we're gonna explore this a little more later on. This is very subjective. What's considered dark humor to one person might not be considered dark humor to someone else. And the definition of this, oddly enough, changes in a society. What's considered, what is this? Because it's, it's more than just edgy. Dark, so edgy humor isn't dark humor. I'm going to show you. <laughs> I'll show you an example. So Family Guy obviously has been around for a while. Um, well, we, I, yeah, we watched a little clip of it last time. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Um, but there's been a couple times, this was the first time, there's been a couple times when an episode of Family Guy has actually been deemed too dark to be aired on television. And, and come on, what, what doesn't get aired on Comedy Central? They'll show anything, right? So if it's deemed too no, you just, in other words, so well, I'll show you this and then we'll see if you can come up with a definition. Again, you may find this dark humor. You may not find this to be dark humor, but see if you can, all of this isn't dark humor. See if you can pull out what was considered the dark humor. In other words, there's a lot of different jokes or things getting made fun of. What's the one thing they made fun of where the producer says, nope, you just can't go there? Well, it's Phil, and I just want to thank you again. You're making us so happy. Well, I wish my husband felt the same way you do, but he's just going to have to accept it. Now, Mrs. Griffin, you should understand a procedure like this is not without its risks. For example, here's what happened when we fertilized an egg from Shelley Duvall with a sperm from James Blunt. Here's Hillary Swank and Gary Busey. Florence Griffith Joyner and Stephen Hawking. Okay, I think that's enough. I got more funny ones. I got Tina Fey and Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, I think we're fine. A lot of face stuff going on in that one. Yeah, let's just get to it. Okay, so the eggs have already been fertilized by means of intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And now the embryos will be inserted. The insertion procedure will be performed by these South American hobitos blowguns. Wait a minute. I don't want them shooting things into my vagina. Well, perhaps you could tell them. If only you spoke hobitos. <laughs> So out of curiosity, have we have we hit the eject button yet? Anything the producers deemed nope, you can't do she said yes. What what do you think it might be? Um, I'm only picking on you because you I saw a nod. Well so far no. This is perfectly acceptable. Nothing, nothing about that was deemed. You might not like it. You might find it kind of offensive or inappropriate. But inappropriate, again, this is why inappropriate doesn't mean dark humor. Just because it's inappropriate, I mean, that's 98% of what's on Comedy Central. So, And if you don't know that the premise of the episode, it might make more contextual sense. Lois is trying to get pregnant. Peter doesn't want her to be pregnant. So they're kind of having a conflict there. Anyway. <laughs> Can't believe she went ahead and did after I specifically told her how I felt. Well, clearly she believed it was within her right. What was just peeing on something? Hey, Brian, you picking up on that? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, everybody. I'm pregnant. Damn it, this is going too fast. I'm going to do something about it. It's got to be now. What do you mean? What are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything, Brian. But sometimes things happen. The house is a dangerous place for today's bonnet woman. Breaking staircases, faulty wiring, gay poltergeists. Boo! To that outfit! <laughs> <laughs> Lois, I've hired some 1980s black breakdance just to do their routine on your stomach. Tina, come on! I'm having this baby and that's the end of it. But Lois, if they do it good enough, they'll save the rec center from being torn down and replaced by some wall. Ozone, turbo, do your thing! Oh no, Lois, those are 90s black guys. Those aren't 80s black guys at all. Run! We're here to dance for the kids. We're on 80s black guys. Do no match for the 90s black guys.
much a bag of drink more police than you. Okay, you know what? Stop it. I know you're not happy about this, but I am pregnant and I am having a baby. So knock it off because I'm a bad. No, I'm bad. I don't want you pregnant. You'll be fat, cranky, and your fools will get bigger and you'll stop having your period. But how I feel about this. No, no, I'm against it, I said. Now, this is important. Naomi and Dale are placing their trust in us. And besides, it's just nine months, then everything will be back to normal. We interrupt this program for a breaking news story. A devastating pileup on I-95 has injured eight people and killed two others. Naomi and Dale Robinson were pronounced dead on arrival at Cohog Hospital. Oh, my God! In other news, a local man has won the lottery. Lucky Cohog resident Dale Robinson has hit the jackpot. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I still just, I can't believe they're gone. They had their whole lives ahead of them. Well, I'll be the one to say it. What are you going to do about the baby? Let's keep it for parts. You know, Lewis, you're not a young woman. Odds are that baby's going to be chromosomally damaged like those cats you see with special animal lupus. Well, that's not going to be easy. Oh, well, that's not going to be easy. Oh, that's not going to be easy. Oh, that's not going to be easy. So, Whiskers, how does it feel to finally win your event after years of training? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why don't you put the baby up for adoption? Well, what do we do until then? I mean, we can't afford nine months of medical bills. Well, you could have an abortion. Hey, you go, Lois. We afford it. Send it on up to Dale and Naomi. Well, they'd probably wait for it anyway. If they want their mittens here, you wouldn't keep them. You'd send them back. Abort the thing. Well, I don't know, Tina. Well, there's no harm in visiting the family planning center just to see what your options are. <sighs> It's such a big decision. Of course it's a big decision. Life is full of big decisions. Like deciding whether or not to have Indian food. Well, Liz, do I need to do anything tomorrow that doesn't involve me being bent over in excruciating pain three feet from the toilet? Well. Yeah, I'm for some chicken masala. Doctor, I won't lie to you. I'm a little upset about this. That's perfectly natural, Mrs. Griffin, and you should ask as many questions as you can before you decide. How's it work, Doc? You strap her down and then go hack an arrow like Sweeney Todd? No, no, good lord. This is not 2005. We've come a long way since then. Okay, watch. So you go scan it in there with a laser and you try to zap it out like um, burning an ant with a magnifying glass? No, Mr. Griffin. Well, so what? You like pull her legs open and like send a pit bull in there? You know, one of those little rat hunting dogs. And then he, he comes back out with it in his mouth and he goes, arr, 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 and you know, you, you can't get it away from him. It's, you know, it, it's his thing. No, Mr. Griffin, it's a very simple, safe procedure in which we very precisely and delicately remove the embryo. We do it all the time, and I promise it's virtually risk free. Well, I have to say, I feel a little better about it. I think this may be the right thing to do. Mrs. Griffin, we have a saying around here let's keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. Okay, well, why don't you get started? I'm going to go sit in the car and pretend like I'm driving. I'm going to be in our face. <laughs> hey, what are you guys bellyaching about? Sir, we are doing all that we can to stop the killing of millions of unborn babies. If you have a few moments, I'd like you to watch this video presentation. Yeah, i got a few minutes. My wife's getting an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you're contemplating having an abortion. But before you do, remember, science has proven that within hours of conception, a human fetus has started a college fund and has already made your first Mother's Day card out of macaroni and glitter. Aww. But don't take my word for it. Just ask my little friend Ziggy. Hi, I'm Ziggy Nisaigo. I'm looking forward to being an active member of your community. Can I hug you? <laughs> of course you can, Ziggy. Because even though they're not visible yet, you already have tiny arms. Arms that will one day work, play, and hold in prayer. Yay! But, uh-oh, what's this? <laughs> oh, my God! Well, he's gone. Just like so many other promising human lives who are probably snuffed out by abortion. Like the guy who would have killed Hitler. Nice Deutsch, my hund. The fourth stooge. That's right. There were supposed to be four stooges. It was gonna be hilarious! And Osama bin Laden's America loving older brother. I would have fucked him out of it! Wow. Thanks a lot for 9 11 abortion enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so making a list here. Which one was it? Because we got a lot. We got a lot to pick from, but 
certain people would watch this and be like, you can't do that. You can't say that. So we have just making fun of abortion in general. Um, the Special Olympics cats, that's there. The gay poltergeist, the 80s versus 90s black guys, um, and then making fun of the pro-life movement and just kind of religion in general. Which one of those was deemed the line? Like how did, like, cause they're all, go, go ahead. Probably brought Osama bin Laden's brother into it. Or what do was that, right? Harkening 9-11? What were you going to say? My guess would be the abortion. Would you believe it was none of those? None of those things were even, no, nope, you can do all that stuff. It was the mis, I didn't put it on the list. It was the making fun of the miscarriage. So that's, that's why, so the theme of the show of Peter trying to induce a miscarriage was considered too dark. So, yeah, it's subjective and it changes all the time. And let me give you an example of how this changes. Um, when I was a kid, The Simpsons had just come out. So the, the Simpsons, right? You probably don't get, it's on like season 85 or something like that. Um, would you consider The Simpsons edgy? I don't think most people today would even know. But when it came out, it was considered really edgy. I, I, luckily, I only lived a quarter mile from the school, so I could easily walk home. I had a t-shirt with Bart Simpson on it and his skateboard. Um, and he was saying, don't have a cow, man. That's what it said. And I went to this, I went to school and they sent me home because I was wearing a Bart Simpson t-shirt. It was considered too taboo. Um, and I wasn't allowed to just turn it inside out because you could still see the don't have a cow man and Bart Simpson. The Simpsons were at one time considered taboo. I, I, I really don't know why. I have to like open up ancient textbooks and find out. But dark humor, what the essential definition of this is, now that we spent 10 minutes, I guess, exploring it a little bit, is poking fun of some kind of instance involving human suffering that society deems a taboo subject. So poking fun at some instance of human suffering that society deems taboo as a subject. Does that mean if you laugh at dark humor that you're a bad person? I don't think so, because it's still humor. You said that society deems what? Society deems it as taboo. Meaning you just don't. That's something that we just don't do. And on an individual level, there might have been two or three things in there that you said, nope, you just you can't do that. But as a society, Society would say, well, it's probably inappropriate, but that's what makes it funny, it's edgy, that's who we are. But there are some lines you just didn't cross. And yeah, it was it's the miscarriage theme, but you just don't go there. So this was unairable. I believe it actually has since aired, technically. I mean, they put it on Netflix and people were allowed to watch it, but when it was an actual show, this was deemed a no-no. So moving on, uh, regressive humor. It's actually not this. Regressive humor, what is this? There's lots of this type of humor out there. I always think of Dumb and Dumber when I think of regressive humor. Regressive humor is humor that takes you back to some kind of childlike state. It often gets labeled as quote unquote stupid humor. So it's often childlike and nonsensical. The next one, incongruity, is pretty easy to describe at this point. This is just when something or someone is presented purposely out of place or used in a way that's completely incorrect. So incongruous. It just means something's out of whack. Something's not right. Something's out of place. Uh, 
puns. You probably know this, right? Puns, this is just a play on words from knock knock jokes to the dad jokes. So very simple. We know what puns are, just a play on words. Lots of those out there. Number eight, what is this? Hey, you've heard this word before. Schadenfreude. Maybe not. You know what this is? What was the, what was the name? You, what did you bring up earlier? Can't remember the name. No. Yeah. What is, what, I mean, essentially, what is that? Why are you laughing? If you laugh at that. If someone fell, someone did something, right? That's, that's, that's what schadenfreude is. Schadenfreude is laughing at someone else's expense. So someone else is getting hurt in some way. You just find it funny. And yeah, if you're wondering, sometimes something, and I, I described this in the assignment, something can be more than one thing at the same time. That, that is entirely possible, too. Um, physical comedy, by the way, often falls into schadenfreude, too. Physical comedy, this is pretty straightforward. It's the visual comedy. Someone's using their own body to make the audience laugh, to make you laugh. It can be intentional, it can be unintentional, but physical comedy. Someone's using their body, so purposely walking into a wall, whatever it is. And then just a quick example of double intent. A lot of this in Austin Powers. I also am to the dangerous. As you wish, sir. But it is your five. I'm sorry, sir. Well, I won't lie to you. Cards are not my bank, by the way. Allow myself to introduce myself. My name is Richie Cunningham. This is my wife, Oprah. My name is number two. This is my Italian confidential secretary. Her name is Alana. Alana Pachana. Come again. Alana Pachana. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just not getting it. It sounded like you said your name was a lot of... Uh... Never mind. <laughs> so double intent is when a word is used with a double meaning. Often sexual in nature. This is also sometimes called double entrada. A double intent is so a word is used with a double meaning at the same time. That double meaning usually sexual or aggressive in nature, which brings us to the next one, which we've already already defined. Tendential wit is any type of humor that relies on any sexual or aggressive themes to make someone so to produce a humorous response. So anything aggressive. That clip you watched from Family Guy was full of tendential wit. Self-deprecating, probably pretty easy. You're making fun of yourself. You are the butt of your own joke. And then finally, I, and I think having been exposed and watched and experienced lots of different types of humor, number 13 maybe I think is I had to pick one that I probably find the most enjoyable. It's this, humor seriously. And that's when something is presented completely out of place, but it's delivered in a purposely serious tone. It's a very, I guess the last thing to add here, it's a very specific type of incongruity. So incongruity just means something is out of place. Humor seriously is when that thing that's out of place, the actors that are in the thing that you're watching are treating it as if it's completely, completely normal, completely deadpan. So if you've ever had someone deliver something completely stupid in a completely deadpan way, that's humor serious. Like how can they stay in character, right? That sort of thing. So we got our types, we got our four categories. What is this and what is this assignment? So, and then we'll just practice together. 
with a relatively famous clip that's setting the stage for something to come later on in the course. So humor dissection, I'll let you read the quote on your own. The quote actually becomes part of the assignment. So I've got your page numbers there. 21 and 22 has a partial list. They actually don't have all of these, but now you have the humor types right in front of you. So here are these steps involved. Number one, you're going to be submitting this to the Dropbox. There's no right or wrong way. It does not need a title page. Um, I don't care how you format it. But you're going to be watching three different things, three different examples of humor pulled from different time periods and different shows, basically. And as you watch these, you're going to be essentially counting the times that you experience these different types of humor. What did they use inside this clip? Some might have three or four, some might have seven or eight. So every time you see one of these examples used in the clip, you make a little, make a mark somehow. Again, I don't care how you do this. The easiest way to do it actually might be to watch it first, get a feel for what it is, um, and then maybe jot down the ones that are used, because there's going to be some that aren't used at all, and then just count how many times. Make a little X, whatever it is. Again, if you're having... For some reason, having trouble doing that, I could easily format that to you. But some kind of Word document where you can essentially count the different types of humor, the different types that are in there. That's step one. However, you want to do that. Number two, before you even do anything, so this is important, before you actually watch any of the clips, just somewhere on a Word document, wherever you like to save it, just write down a quick paragraph, just a quick reflection on what you think, looking at these different types. What do you think you find the most humorous? I just told you, I think number 13 for me is what I usually find the most funny, but that's just me. But what types do you think you enjoy the most? And which ones you enjoy the least and why? So before you start, this will also become part of the assignment, this paragraph that you watch or that you write before you do this. Go to the course website and view each example of the humor that's there. Well, real quick, what's up here? Um, Ellen Peel, there's an example from there. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these. Some of these you may have seen, some of you may have, may have not. A very famous uh, skit from Saturday Night Live, uh, the Cowbell skit. Maybe some of you are familiar with this, some of you are not. And then one, I thought it'd be interesting to go back in time. You know, sometimes humor ages well, and sometimes humor does not age well. Um, back about 20 years ago, this was considered probably one of the top five or six SNL clips out there. We'll see how it holds up. Um, I don't know, I'm, I just, I put it out there for a reason and we'll talk about next week too, but the Japanese game show. Famous clip was Chris Farley. Oh, and Mike Myers that we just watched. So these are the three clips to use in the assignments. There's the Dropbox. That'll, you'll understand why that's there in a second. Oh, we're almost close. So as you watch each example, keep a little tally. Of course, if you, if you can't pick up the audience laughing, yes, there's usually a few. Again, you might have to pause it as you go, perfectly fine. Then, after each clip, just tell me how funny you thought it was. It's a one, that's fine. It's a 10, that's fine too. And then the discussion post, and the prompts are all up there. Um, and then you can see the grading. This is a little bit more than your typical discussion post, because in, in a non-pandemic world, this would probably just be a paper that you would turn in. You just, But I thought, hey, we're using the discussion forums, let's use that. And that eliminates, you don't need a title page, you don't need a reference page, so just do the work and submit it as a discussion post. And you can see what the other people thought too. I think that's a neat aspect of the discussion forums. And you can also compare, like, oh, wait a second, comparing mine to that person's, maybe I should add something, because maybe that wasn't enough. So if you go to the discussion post, oh, let's go to our forum. There you go. Well, two people have looked at it. Yay. There you go. All the prompts are there. Um, and yeah, so I, I mentioned in there on the instructions, usually this would be about a two page paper or so. So what I would recommend, and you don't have to do it this way, but I'd recommend typing it up actually as, as a paper um, and then just cutting and pasting in there. That way you know it's fine. Um, and then your the research that you do, that aspect, that's what you submit to the actual Dropbox. So that Word document that you made with the tallies, submit that to the Dropbox. And then the written part will go to the discussion. Yeah. Are we able to just do like answering question one on like our Word document or that we're doing for the discussion post? Just like one, like in my response to this prompt. 
Actually, okay. you should write it out like, like it's a paper okay. instead of doing the bullet points. Like, okay. does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Good question, though. So just like, in other words, pretend this is a paper that you're just cutting and pasting inside the discussion board. Okay. It should be pretty straightforward. Try to be as detailed as possible. But if you do have any questions, just let me know. And again, this isn't due until Monday. So since we had a day off and this wasn't up there, so Sunday at midnight is null and void for this week. We'll wait until Monday. Monday at midnight to get this in. Um, so just for fun, let's practice this together. So you got your sheets, and I'll play along, and we'll see how well you pick up on this stuff. If you've never seen this before, again, this will actually play a role in our class. So I'm, it's funny to me, but we're also planting a seed for about seven or eight weeks down the road. So just keep this in mind. Um, something that's important for context that will make it more meaningful in about a month, it's fun to say, right? Is that this was actually Chris Farley's debut on Saturday Night Live. See, I'm not sure, does anyone, does anyone not know who Chris Farley is? You don't know who, so you'll, you'll know. You'll know which one he is. So this is his date, so the, this is his very first crack at being on Saturday Night Live. Ever. But, so you got our list. Let's see how good you can, I'm not gonna pause it, so it'll be in the moment. See how many things you can pick up on. This is impossible. Can't we just hire them both? No, we've been through this. We've only got the budget for one dancer. Yeah, but they're both so great, I can't decide between them. Well, that's our job. That's what Chip and Dale pays us for. I know, but these guys have been through hell. A five-hour audition, three callbacks. Well, look, if you want to give up your salary so Chip and Dale can hire both of these guys, that's fine with me. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Marcy, Freeman, this is the part of the job that I hate. Adrian? Barney? Listen, before we start, I just want to say once again that either one of you would make a fine addition to the Chippendale family. I know you've been put through a long, long audition, and it's been hard. But I think that in itself is a testament to how good both of you are and just how difficult our choice is. I wish I could just flip a coin and be done with it, but we can't. We're Chippendales. Marcy, <laughs> music. Thank you, Adrian, Barney, if you could just give us a minute, we'll have our decision. <laughs> oh, oh, Adrian, you were great out there, man. I know, it's gonna be you. Oh, what are you talking about, Barney? You got it, you know it. Whatever, whatever happens, you're the best. 
Buddies. Buddies. Never make a party, guys. Adrian, Barney, well, we've made our decision. But before we tell you, I just want to say once again how truly difficult it was for us to make our choice. And to thank you for your patience throughout this long, arduous audition. Thanks. Yes. We're going to go with Adrian. I knew it, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I just never wanted you so much in my life. And now that I got it, I just can't deal with it. Well, that's okay, Adrian. We understand. Barney, we all agreed that your dancing was great. Your presentation was very sexy. Uh, I guess I guess in the end, we all thought that Adrian's body was just much, much better than yours. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. You see, it's just that at Chippendales, our dancers have traditionally had that lean, muscular, healthy physique, like Adrian's. Whereas yours is, well, fat and flabby. <laughs> right, right. No, Barney. No, no. No, Barney, we've, we've made our decision. Uh... Uh, excuse me, can I, can, I, can I make a point? Sure. Uh, I just want to say, this guy he is one hell of a dancer, you know, and he's got the sexiest moves I have ever seen. And if you're really serious about going with me, you know, it can only be because his body is so bad. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, you know, but, okay, because on straight dancing and presentation, ain't no way I'm better than him. Uh, amen. Amen. You see, Barney, we consider the possibility that our heavier female customers might actually prefer a heavy, heavier man that they could identify with. Uh, but then we decided, even as I stood there listening to them explain why they had chosen me, I still couldn't believe it. Ever since I could remember, I had dreamed of becoming a Chip and Nails dancer, and now I was one. I never saw Barney again, but I'll never forget him, and how for one brief moment, he brought out the best in me. That was the time of my life. Of course, it's really strange to think that both of them are no longer here, which is a little strange. But, so that's Chris Farley's Saturday Night Live debut. So, what do you got? Do we have any irony? Not really. Uh, not in the way it's presented anyway. Satire or mockery? <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, I put a question mark, but you could argue, you could make the argument that they're making fun of Chip and Mills, the organization, right? So absolutely. So that could be there. Sarcasm. Uh, no, so here's here's why there wouldn't be. So they're they're playing characters in here. I mean, you could, if you said, aren't they making fun of Chris Farley? Well, not really. Uh, it's they're they're playing characters inside the skit. So if they made fun of someone outside the skit, in the skit, then it would be sarcasm against somebody. But contained in the skit, there wasn't any sarcasm. Black or dark humor? No, not even nowhere near that. Um, regressive humor? Anything? Again, and by the way, this is also an exercise in you realizing it sounds easy at the beginning, right? But you, you're, hopefully you're quickly realizing that how subjective humor is. What one person sees, another person might not see. And that other person can make a completely logical justification as to why they think they saw something, right? This is one thing that makes studying humor so freaking difficult. It sounds fun and it sounds easy, but you quickly realize how subjective humor is it makes it really difficult. You got to be really careful how you set up experiments and studies because you got to control for that somehow. And that's, it keeps you up at night. Um, you could technically probably make an argument. I didn't, I didn't have it in there only because it's contained within the skit itself. Incongruity. Well, yeah. yeah, what, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. And so really just one check mark. I and mean, what's incongruous is, well, having someone who's completely overweight being a Chippendales dancer. It's right there in front of you. Puns. No, uh, Shattenfrog. 
Again, it depends on your explanation. I would technically say no, because we're not. You as an audience member are la may, might be laughing at Chris Farley's expense, but he's not getting hurt in this kit at all. So, so there's no one's falling down, no one's getting hurt. So I didn't have a good physical comedy. Yeah, absolutely. So this is here's well, I don't want to give too much away. Um, but I guess the the not so funny side of this is Chris Farley, believe it or not, did not intend to become the type of comedic actor that he was. He, he never intended to become the fat guy that everyone laughs at on Saturday Night Live. That was not his goal. But because of this skit, because of his debut, he became molded into that because people found it hilarious. And people walked away from this thinking, oh my gosh, he's the next physical comedy genius. This guy's great. And he loved it. He loved the reaction that he got from the audience. So he started to rely on that. But yeah, physical comedy, double intent, not so much. And then she'll win. I mean, somewhat. It's a Chippendale skit. You know, Patrick Swayze's being sexual, he's being sexual. So, yeah, a glimmer of that. But about self deprecating? I didn't, I didn't have that. Only because it's, Chris Farley's not really making fun of himself at this. He's not. He's, he's coming off humor seriously. Oh, gosh, yes. In fact, I actually counted the instances. I got up to nine separate instances of them saying something purposely dead tannery, or then the Chippendales actors do. So the most obvious, and I use this as an example for myself, um, I would have, I've seen this so many times now, and maybe that I know the backstory, it makes it less funny to me because I know what Chris was going through inside his head. Um, but I remember when this first debuted, watch, watching with my friend Donnie late at night on Saturday in my family room, we were literally in tears, like one of those, like it was hurting so bad watching this. So yeah, this would have been like a nine out of 10 when I first watched it. And sure enough, what's there? Humor seriously. So this would have perfectly lined up with my prediction and what I thought was there. So does that work? Does that make sense? That's how you dissect humor with the different types. Of... All right, so I planted a little seed. Again, I'm thinking about this replication project. Again, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like. Um, if you have any ideas, feel free. Let me know. Other than that, um, we were going to start Freud and some theories of humor, but it seems silly to start that with six minutes to go. And we would just get rolling and then we'd have to say bye. So you got your stuff. You have your walking orders for the week. Everything's up there. Um, I'll actually post a written out version of the types in case you lose that sheet of paper that I gave you. So you'll have all those there. And if you have any questions over your time, just let me know. But I think it, it should walk you through it pretty easily. And what's on tap next week is chapter two. We'll get into some different theoretical perspectives. But that's it. Ending the stream.